Thank you very much for the award. I appreciate it. Uh, I prepared some slides. I'll try to keep it short, but hopefully it will be fun a little bit. Uh, I wanted to provide some reflection on DM, but before that, I think I want to talk about Morris Wilkes. I think we should recognize him more than anyone else. That he's the, he, the award is named for him, and he's the father of microprogramming, and this is the seminal paper on microprogramming. You probably know him for the cash paper. It turns out he's not the original inventor of the cash, actually. This is the first paper that I could find on caches. So if, if, you, if you know of an earlier paper on caches, I'd love to uh, hear about that. So it's humbling to receive an award named after such a true researcher and pioneer. But I'd like to thank many people. Uh, there are many people to thank, clearly my advisor, Gail Pat. He's the reason why I'm doing computer science today. I could have easily done psychology. He was competing with a very strong professor, Psych 101 professor, James Lloyd Hilton. They're, they're, they were both great teachers and great researchers, I think. I'm going to thank all my past and current teachers and family, my students and trainees. They're all sitting at that table. I think there are eight of them here. Lavanya, Gena, Yishin, Samira, Sagara, Tyler, Hassan, and Amir Ali. I'll thank my collaborators and past research groups, and definitely funding agencies and many industrial partners. And this is my group. Let me quickly go over a sketch of the DRM work. Uh, I think it's, it's important to go, go through some technical uh, talks and awards. So this is the first work that we've done actually on memory controllers. It's all started with memory controllers. This is with Eric Spangle. We looked at FSB controllers at the time, front-side buffer controllers, uh, front-side bus controllers. And then when I went to Microsoft Research, we looked at memory performance attacks and how to actually prevent them. If you have unfair memory controllers, how do you prevent them? And we did a lot of work, which I'm not going to go through clearly, some of which are implemented in industrial controllers and they're very nice review comments. We'll get back to you later on. Uh, and these are to recognize my students. I'll put these slides uh, online because they're the ones who really uh, did the work later on at uh, CMU. Okay, uh, so basically I think the future is memory controls are still critical to research and they will become even more important. Uh, there's a lot more to do in memory control. It's not all done. There are many goals, many constraints, and many metrics. And I think machine learning could actually play a role. This is some work we did with Engin uh, uh, a while back. So there are many new problems. I believe many memory needs intelligent controllers. Later, we moved on to DRM scaling issues concurrently. And this is an earlier position paper that I presented at the International Memory Workshop. There are many challenges in DRM scaling. I'm not going to bore you with a lot of them. This is one of the earlier works that we did, uh, subarray level parallelism. It turns out you can, at, with very low cost, uh, you can enable uh, parallel access to many parts of DRM and reduce the impact of bank conflicts. And Samsung and Intel later picked it up and they wrote this paper where they evaluated the subarray level parallelism in a lot of detail and they showed that this could enhance DRM scaling. So the takeaway is low cost DRM changes can enable large scale parallelism. And this is a, a more recent example. Later we tackled the refresh problem. This is one of the problems that we were tackling in DRM. And it turns out you can eliminate most of the refreshes, but it's not an easy problem because uh, the retention time of DRM cells depend on the location, depend on the values, and depend on the time. And this is one of the earlier papers we wrote, but we weren't satisfied. We actually wanted to build infrastructure to really, truly understand these issues. And I'm going to show you a bunch of these infrastructures over here. It's open source. There are people using it, and we'd be happy to support it going forward. So we actually did a lot of studies with these uh, refreshes, with uh, retention management issues with collaborators. And this is, the, this is actually a paper that's being presented right now at ESN in the best paper session by one of my students. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not able to attend that right now. So the takeaway is most refreshes can be eliminated, but if you want to eliminate them, you actually need intelligent controllers and main memory. So I think I also talk to some of the younger members of our community. I think I, I really build, uh, believe in building infrastructure. That's what we did with a lot of these works. And we also actually open source a lot of the infrastructure. This is emulator, which is used by a lot of industry uh, as well as academia. Let me talk about Rohammer. So while actually uh, we were doing a lot of these studies. We also found that you can predictably induce errors in most DRM memory chips. And this is actually the first example of, of a simple hardware failure mechanism can create a widespread system security vulnerability. And people start writing articles like this or get software. Now hackers are exploiting physics. I'm not going to go through the details again. A simple program can induce many errors by hammering a row. And it turns out you can take over an otherwise secure system. That's what we said in the paper. And Google Projects you had later proved that. And there has been a lot of work in the security community that took advantage of Rohammer, as you can see. And this is going to appear in Open 2020. It's called Rambly. There are very interesting names over here. And this may be another security application that may come later. <laughs> you don't want that, of course. So clearly, there are solutions that we developed also. Our paper actually proposed seven solutions. And Apple picked up on one of them, which is the easiest to pick up on. 
Uh, our solution was more probabilistic. Again, I'm not going to bore you with the details, but it's adopted in some of the Intel memory controllers recently. You can see that you can actually adjust the probability at the user level uh, and device. We recently ordered a retrospective on Rohammer, if you're interested. This is five years later, so it was uh, picked up as a special, uh, in the special issue of, uh, on the topics for hardware and embedded security. Okay, so I think uh, the main memory needs intelligent controls for security as well. Let me go through this relatively quickly. Essentially, I think Rohammer generated a new mindset that enabled a renewed interest in hardware security research. Real chips are vulnerable and in a simple and uh, widespread manner, and hardware reliability is now connected to security. Okay, I'm going to skip this. I will talk about uh, a couple of things very quickly. This was the first time we submitted the Rohammer paper, it was rejected. So if you're a young researcher, don't, don't get upset about that. You can see that the reviews are not very good over here. Uh, but I think some of them maybe missed the point. They said this is not my architecture. Uh, they said this doesn't happen in real DRAM chips or real DRAM usage scenarios and some other comments. And we later submitted to ISCA actually, uh, one year later, and it got, it got in, but so, some people said that we actually, this is already known. Well, when we actually started the research, it was really not known after, uh, because of the review process, it actually, other people actually talked about it also. So I think I have some suggestions based on this uh, to the reviewers. I'm not going to go through all of these, these slides will be available. I think it's good to be fair, be open-minded, be accepting of diverse research methods actually, uh, uh, yesterday, Norm had a very nice talk that talked about the same thing. There's a lot of diversity in the me research methods. We should be accepting of all of them. And I think constructive, uh, being constructive is important and not having double standards. I think the, the, the downside is if we don't do this, we block or delay scientific progress. Uh, uh, this is a suggestion to the community. I think we need to really fix the review accountability problem that we have and eliminate double standards in the community. Suggestion to, so on a more positive note, suggestion to young researchers, follow your passion. Basically, do not get derailed by these things. Be resilient, and I, I would focus on learning and scholarship. This is actually what I uh, teach my students also. And the quality of your work defines your impact in the end. I'm not going to bore you with other DRAM scaling issues. You can refer to uh, these, but I'm going to talk very quickly about uh, uh, the, the work that we're doing on in-memory computation. Uh, basically, we wrote th these papers on in-memory bitwise operations. Uh, they were rejected several times. Uh, basically, the input performs a lot. Sounds good, no? Uh, you can see these, you get the reviews like this. I wanted to expose these reviews because a lot of students are actually seeing these reviews also. You, you see a great strength over here, but the weakness is nobody will ever build it. I'm not sure if this is a good idea to reject the paper, but we got rejected for that reason. That's true for this one also. Uh, actually, this says basically this is not an architecture paper, it's a circus paper. I think both mentality is not good actually. Some, uh, if, if, you have, if you actually don't put it out, it will, you guarantee that it will never be built. <laughs> and also, I think we should be more accepting of papers that span communities. Uh, if you don't take anything from this talk, I, I would suggest taking this one. This is, uh, this is a, how many people know this book? This is Rad Jane's book, yeah. <laughs> this is one of my favorite books. Uh, and this is one of my favorite pages in the book that says this is in Maker's Games. Basically, even if something is done, analysis is done perfectly correctly, the student maker can reject because by saying this needs more analysis. So it's an endless game, essentially. And I like this, there, there, there are actually 26 reasons he lists as to why they can reject. And the last one says, why change? Everything's working okay. <laughs> so let me talk about into the future a little bit. Uh, I think computing, I'm almost done. <laughs> computing is bottlenecked by data. Future innovations will be even more bottlenecked by memory going forward. And we need architectures that handle data well. Data-centric, data-driven, data-aware. I'd be happy to talk about all of these. But we need to somehow solve the data movement problem that's really plaguing our computing systems today. Because it's really plaguing our computer systems, in my opinion. But to be able to do that, I think we really need to revisit the entire stack. We cannot take the attitude that this is a circuits paper, this is an OS paper, this is an architecture paper. We should really uh, revisit the stack. And we can get there step by step, I think. And if you're interested, we've written a paper on processing in memory in its current form. Uh, I'd be happy to talk about that. I think that way maybe we can uh, approximate what we're, what we may be interested in approximating at some point. Let me leave you with two quotes. This is George Bernard Shaw. I assume many people know him. He's an Irish playwright. Progress is impossible without change, and those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. And I think I'll leave with the Carnegie Mellon motto over here. My heart is in the work. Thank you very much. <laughs>